Okay, so welcome to the uh, newest episode of the Neary Discussion Series. Um, I'm joined here today by Colette Bennett from Social Justice Ireland. Um, and we're going to discuss what we know about what's happened to the labour market since COVID as we emerge from COVID. And obviously, um, some sectors were affected more than others by shutdown, by decree, and then, you know, there's working from home um, complexities there as well. What are we seeing? We've seen the, 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 the latest data is from the final quarter of 2021, which is almost back to normal. Of course, we had Christmas kind of um, new, new, new um, lockdown regulations come in before Christmas, which would have affected accommodation field quite a bit. Um, and we await in the, in the next while that the first quarter, which will be kind of the, the first normal quarter. Of course, the first few weeks of January, are, we were still in, in semi-lockdown in terms of the combination field, but we'll, we'll, be, we'll, we'll be soon to be seeing, you know, the dust settling, right? So, but what do we know at the moment? We've had, you know, we, we have average increases in in um, wages in some sectors, which might be compositional, like especially in accommodation field, a lot of people have dropped out of labor market in the in in the 2020 for PUP, and they happen to be low wage workers, which meant the average actually went up. And then in 2021, we were starting to see the average coming down, even though more people were actually going back to work. So it was just because these lower wage jobs were, were, were returning. So, and we, we we've, heard about um you know recruitment issues in in some areas particularly in the combination field obviously things like nursing and construction continue and they, they're long long-standing issues in terms of recruitment and on top of all this obviously we've got inflation and the most recent number was seven percent i think annual which means you know Wages only started picking up in 2018, really after the financial crisis, at least with any considerable growth in average and median wages. It was about three, three and a half percent for a couple of years. That means, you know, they're wiped out, right? Or at least a couple, two years of, of gains are wiped out by one year of bad inflation. So obviously this comes into, um, you know, minimum wage. Nobody's talking about minimum wage going up by this much. We saw deprivation increase in 2019 right so that's a year where wages grew employment grew the economy grew uh, and there was strong wage growth and yet we saw the the share of workers who were unable to afford the minimum essential standard of living or or just just minimum um, you know regular uh, living living costs uh the, the share that were unable to afford those increased in 2019 so that increased again in 2020 and it's likely when we get the silk data that it increased in 2021 um so what 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 did you find interesting from the last few few um f- few rounds of data correct yeah so i mean i suppose you've raised a whole load of really interesting things i mean one of the ones that if i could have it on a T-shirt and throw it out of a T-shirt gun at everybody, uh, is that whole thing about the increase in average wages and just what a misnomer that is. I mean, it's it's only there because so many low-income workers lost their jobs. So it's only increased because there have been so many job losses in low-paid sectors. And I think, you know, we need to be very cautious about using that type of data when we talk about how well we're doing as a country and how we're seeing these increases. They're not being felt across the board. And in fact, they're being felt the least by those who could really do it some level of, of income. I mean, when we looked and I know that, you, you know, we're talking about the, the labor market, but certainly even when you look at the type of, of cost of living, as you say, in order to meet the cost of living for people on core social welfare rates that didn't get anything in budgets 2020 and 2021 and got a fiver in last year's budget, um, we're, you're looking at over 20 euro a week of an increase. Now, that's, you know, it's not going to happen. We know, I mean, government is very, very unlikely to make that type of thing happen. But when you're looking at people on low incomes, including low income workers, and you're trying to make that match towards the cost of living that we're seeing, 
it's just it's there's just no match to be made. It's off the wall. And again, you know, you were talking about where we're almost back from where we were in 2019 in terms of the, the labor data. And we've got, you know, an unemployment rate now of just under the five percent. But again, when you start interrogating that, we've got more part time workers. So we've got a, roughly about 130,000 more part time workers. Yeah, about 50 percent of the growth I was looking at yesterday was is part time work compared to a 21, 22 percent overall rate in the economy. So it's massive. Going on here. Yep. And, you know, you've got. Again, there's a there's an uplift in underemployment. So we went in quarter four, 2020, to under the 100,000, 98,200, to 100, or sorry, 98,900, to 110,200 underemployed. So people who have a part-time job and are willing and able to work more hours. So again, when we talk about, you know, bouncing back, these are the things that we need to, to be very conscious of. These are the things that we're, we're, we need to be aware of. We've got, you know, over 100,000 people. Am I right in saying about 130,000 people who are long term unemployed? So, again, that's increasing because certainly if you were an older worker in low low paid employment and you lost your job during the pandemic and the, the likelihood of you returning to employment was lower. So, you know, we've got we've got that issue that isn't being addressed when we only concentrate on these kind of overall numbers. The, the, there's other issues there with just even how we count those. And we were talking about this earlier on. Um, you know, we've even, even still, right, we've got about two thirds of all employments in accommodation and food, which is the one which is always in the, you know, the one we're concerned about in the, in the news and recruitment issues. Um. And the, 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 the 40, oh, the, the, it was in the, the CSO labor market bulletin in there, number 10, that like 45% of the entire wage bill of that uh, sector was still being paid for by the state through the employment wage subsidy. So what happens when that get, they're, they're resisting any, you know, calls for increases in minimum wage to, to deal with inflation. But also, you know, what's what's going to happen when those are taken away? There's also on, on how we're counting the unemployed, you said under under five percent, but the adjusted rate, which includes those on PUP, is I think as far as I recall, more closer to seven percent. And you know, we've been we've been kind of counting these uh people who were forced, obviously they were forced into unemployment by lockdown and everything like that. So they're not really unemployed as we understand it, the ILO status where you're searching for work. They're not employed either. And I, I, we've been kind of uh, counting that funny. And I wonder what, you know, once once PUP is withdrawn, I know, I think it, the plans for EWSS to be withdrawn are for next month, for April. Um, and I'm not too. I'm, I'm not exactly sure when POP is is done. I thought it was. I thought it was close to the day now. Mm. Um, so I, I just wonder what the these are kind of storms on the horizon that um, we're. I I think it, it is under discussed. Yeah, absolutely. Now I I, I told you a lie there. The long term unemployed is forty four thousand three hundred. Um, but again, up from thirty six thousand eight hundred. Like we're seeing more people moving away from the labor market and that's what i mean just not to cut you off but that's what i mean with the long-term unemployed the, there's a lot of people who've been nine months or more out of work yeah. let's call it that in in the in the labor market due to a myriad of factors including being forced to but they're not in that long-term unemployed figure of even though it's gone up yeah. I would argue that the same, you know, the conceptually or the, you know, theoretically the same issues about you know being being away from the labour market, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, will apply to will apply to these people, and are not really counted like they they might have been in the past. Absolutely, and I mean, you know, I've seen your work on that whole area around the the accommodation and food sector, and you know, on the one side, when you see the big kind of headlines of we just can't get the staff. The, you know, the social justice president in me is looking at it. Go well. If you paid enough, you know, if you can't afford to pay a living wage, then you don't have a viable business. So that call out for we can't get the staff who are willing to go on poverty wages 
you know, poverty fixed your wages headline. that are for, that are subsidised by forty five percent by the state right now. Like, yeah, I mean, you know, we talk the word entitlement gets thrown around a lot in, <laughs> in Ireland, but it's at other groups. Do not, you know, have an entitlement to slave labour. Like the, yeah. the 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 state already subsidised before the pandemic. The state subsidised a lot of this employment through uh, supplementary welfare allowance. We all know, and we'll get get to your housing affordability stuff soon. But we all know what the cost of housing is, and we know what minimum wage is, and that's all you have to. You, you know, you know, if if you're if a, sharing a one bed in Dublin is eight hundred euro, and your minimum wage is ten fifty, then you have to work for two weeks to cover that, or or, or thereabouts. You know, uh, full time. So we 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 understand these things, and these are. The, the state intervenes because because the, the, there's such a gap between the living wage and the minimum wage, and uh, yet the and now forty five percent of the wage bill is being looked after. Now I don't know that that was the final quarter, so that might that's pr- likely lower now. Um, but it's yeah, it, it, it's yeah, it's it's, it's um, the messaging you, you know in terms of where we're going. Yeah. What what our what our view what our what our vision of the Irish economy is into the into the future is you know um, this kind of you know subsistence wages is, is not attractive for a lot of people and it's not a way a lot of you know highly educated younger people I think envision the future you know. But nor should it be attractive. Do you know what I mean? Like it's it. I think there's a lot of the kind of beggars can't be choosers narrative around this type of stuff. You should be happy to have a job, any job. But like that is that's crushing for people. That is, you know, if we talk about this new building of a well-being framework that we saw after budget 2021 and there was a whole report at the middle of last year from the Taoiseach's office, then that this part of it, what people do for a living, how they make their living and how that living supports them to actually live should be a huge part of that. I mean, when you look at the, the number of hours that are worked, so the that, that Labour Force survey it went into the kind of the hours worked as well. So we saw 2020, less, you know, there was six and 6.6 million hours less in 2020 that were worked. And that's, you know, due to lockdown and restrictions, you know, you can make that argument. There was an increase in 2021 then on the back of that of 6.8 million hours. Again, you know, you can understand why that. But then when you drill down into the sectors, so accommodation of food obviously lost a whole load of hours. They went from 5.1 million to 2.4 million in from quarter four 2019 to quarter four 2020. They've come back up to 4.1 million in the latest. So they're still down a million hours on the pre-pandemic levels. That was the annual figure now or the quarterly figure? That was the annual figure, yeah. So, you know, we're still seeing that gap there. But if you look at higher paid jobs, higher paid professions, the information and communication sector bounced back, the professional scientific and technical services bounced back. In fact, they've actually surpassed their pre-COVID levels. So higher paid jobs have rebounded faster than those in lower paid employment. So yeah. it's, it's, you know, and then we have on top of all of that, the cost of living crisis that we're seeing. We've got the impact of the Ukrainian crisis, and that is disproportionately impacting people on lower incomes. Yeah, so I, I was looking into that and that, that, that fascinated me, the, um, especially the bounce in IT jobs, because it's massive and it's a, it's a really good thing. Obviously, they, they're some of the highest paying jobs you can get. I think they're the, I think they're the highest in the Norwich context anyway. I was looking at it, and again, the employment growth. We're talking a lot of my work is on generational issues, you know, and a lot of you know, and you're you're talking lower wage. It's a, there's a big there's a there's a big overlap there. Yeah. And again, you know, the about two thirds of the employment bounce in um, in IT uh, was actually for over forties, obviously male dominated as well, um, and but that's across the board the, yeah. the 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 employment growth has gone to on disproportionately to over 40s where i would argue like we we've, we've we've had this younger people problem for since since 2008 basically and it's not and you know we're as on as you've written about before we're doing everything later now 
be, because of this, because of the issues in the labour market that younger people face. So although yeah, obviously it's a good thing, it'll be good for revenue, it'll be good for 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 growth, for productivity, all that kind of stuff. There's st- there's still a, a an inequity there. There's still this is, and I wonder if it's older workers who you know, working from home, maybe maybe even returning to, to the labour market because I can't, anecdotally, I couldn't make any sense with a few friends in IT and I was like, well, what's, are you hiring loads from working from home or what? And he's like, no, we laid off 25% of the staff. So I'm trying to, um, you know, get, get a, a hold on where, where this growth is actually happening. Um, the, the, yeah. I think the thing you mentioned there, though, where you're saying, you know, it is older workers, and it's predominantly men. I think there is a, and it, it. I haven't seen anything look into it in any great detail, but certainly when the Women's Council came out with their research in the middle of 2020, and they said that 85% of the increase in caring burden rested with women. And then the CSO came out in December 2020, actually, with their um, expectation of return to the labour force. And what we found there was the... There were more men than women who had been impacted, whose employment had been impacted, but far more women than men did not expect to go back to the labour force because of the increased responsibilities. I saw like the CSO had one particular one on married women. That's what they they, how they uh, what what they call this group. And, they, you know, as part of their on staff bank and and publicly Mm. available. And then there was just this big drop off in 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 twenty twenty a massive uh, a massive fall in participation uh, in that initial year when I suppose you know um, we were still ironing out the kinks of working from home and and, and tech, like Zoom and all that kind of stuff was only yeah. you know made massive made massive leaps in those few months. Um, but that's they had and I, I put it in my own labor market observer there um that there was just i think it was six or seven points uh drop in participation for for married women and it's a, it's a team we do a lot with you know the interaction with ch- child care and stuff like that that uh irish irish women of a certain age tend to tend to drop out more regardless of the the level of education than um than other and countries you know that is something i mean we you know, time and time again, we look at the education data and we see girls doing better than women or sorry, girls doing better than boys at standardized testing. And that follows through in tertiary education. And then obviously there are choices that are made and, you know, we could we could have another podcast uh, about, you know, what makes people make the choices that they make, how gendered those choices are. Um, but then there's just a complete fall off when it comes to employment gaps and it comes to gender pay gaps and it comes to the caring deficit. I thought, um, who was it? Um, oh, there was one of the trade unions did a, a Europe map on caring responsibilities for International Women's Day. And like that, you know, the, the gap, but again, particularly for Ireland in terms of you know, participation in terms of part time employment um, in terms of caring responsibilities. It's huge. And yes, absolutely. Child care is going to be a big issue. But and it, obviously the cost of it and subsidizing the cost of that needs to be a policy that that has to be seriously considered at this point. But it's it's also the other responsibilities, the weight of responsibilities, the that kind of second job, um, you know, the invisible second job. And it's again, it comes down to it tends to come down to women, whether that's caring for children or caring for older people. Yeah. Yeah, that's um, and that, you know, those issues will, you know, I, I, I still feel like people. I mean, it depends on if we're going to get dragged back to the office or who's going to get dragged back to the office kind of thing and the decisions to be made there. But I don't see childcare costs going down at any stage. And they're, they're even more complex now as well. My, my sister is a, as a young child and, you know, with COVID, there's any kind of a sniffle or anything like that. They're, all, they're sent home. And of course, it's her who's, who's, who's mostly the one who, who, who stays at home, you know. Um, so we've got we've got storms on the horizon. We we had storms on the horizon before the massive storm hit the horizon <laughs> in 2020 as well. And I think those are, you know, obviously they they took a back seat in terms of attention um, during the, the last the last two crazy years. Um, but housing is obviously, 
you know, I'm, I'm, I'm in the market myself now and it's not getting any better. Um, and we've seen again a, a whatever, almost double digit growth in, in house prices over the last year. Um, supply issues there on, on the horizon again, even worse or even even falling. So you you did some good work on, on housing affordability there before Christmas. Can you tell us what you what you found? Yeah, so this was based on the the Silk data from 2020. So it was published at the end of last year, uh, and we published a piece just looking at housing and poverty. Um, and what it looked at was the impact of housing costs. Now, by housing costs, it was only mortgage interest, so not the cost of actually buying the asset um, and uh, rent. And what we saw was the poverty rate. So the you know it's using the standard poverty rate or the, the standard calculation of poverty. So sixty percent of the equivalent disposable income, um, and that jumped from thirteen point two percent, so about six hundred sixty thousand people, um, to nineteen percent. So almost a million people, it's, it's almost one in five. Um, so just due to housing costs, that's where people's disposable incomes are, are, are you know, driving down. And then when we looked at, you know, and it was, it was one table that the CSO produced and when it drilled down into kind of who was most impacted on this, again, it's the, it's the usual, I suppose, the usual suspects, it's lone parents, 50%, one in every two people living in a lone parent household is living in poverty after they've paid for their rent or their housing costs. Um, and then subsidies. So households in receipt of subsidies, they had a poverty rate pre kind of housing costs. Now, part of that is because the HAP or the subsidy, the HAP, the rent supplement or the, the RAS is included in the income. Yes. Um, but they had they went from having a poverty rate. Imagine on, it wasn't. Sorry? Imagine it wasn't. <laughs> We see, absolutely imagine it wasn't. Um, but I mean, that, that that went from, sorry, that went from um, 26% to 55 point, sorry, 22.7% to 55.9. So 56% of people who are living in subsidized accommodation are living in poverty. Um, now, there was a lot of narrative about that. There was a lot of debate about it. You know, we, we were very lucky. It, it got covered quite a lot. And what we found was it highlighted the real issues around housing costs and just how unaffordable housing is for people who can actually get a home, whether that's through rent or through home ownership, through a mortgage. But what came out of it was a whole kind of sub debate around housing subsidies. Now, my take on this is, if 56% of people who are living in subsidized accommodation are living in poverty, housing subsidies don't work. Um, and the, the opposite, opposite of that was very much what came back at me. Um, and that the reason for that is because there is a, a mind frame that says, and I was on, I was on a, a housing uh, seminar with a guy called Rod Hick from Cardiff University, does a huge amount of, of research. And his he actually said that a very similar thing was he was saying, well, obviously, housing subsidies work because they decrease the, the rate of housing cost overburden. Now, if that were if that was the objective of housing subsidies, then fine, I'd accept that. But that's not what housing subsidies are meant to do. Housing subsidies were introduced and certainly HAP, the housing assistance payment, was introduced in September 2014 to provide what was called a, a social housing solution because there were so many people following the crash in 20, 2008 um, and what happened with house prices kind of mid-2012 into 2013 where there was a real lull. Um, what was happening was there was a huge amount of people on rent supplement. Rent supplement gets paid directly into the tenant's hand. At a time of massive unemployment of and, and of basically trying to make ends meet, you had, and I worked in the debt sector at the time, you had people who were making the choice between putting food on the table or paying the landlord. And so introduced HAP. And HAP was essentially rent supplement, but paid directly to the landlord instead of to the tenant. So what that, that is, is essentially a, a guarantee of landlord income. It does nothing about affordability at all. 
what it was characterized as then in July 2016, when Rebuilding Ireland came in, was a, a social housing solution. So this was meant to, I suppose, replace the, the building of, of social housing that had been absolutely destroyed back in the kind of 80s. Um, but if that's what it was meant to be, if that's the objective, then it, it isn't meeting that objective. It is of it is failing. There is no other word for it. If 56% of the people who are living in subsidized housing are living in poverty, it's not providing the home that it should be providing. There are more, and again, if you compare it to the, the households who are living in local authority tenanted accommodation. So again, there's a slightly different methodology when you look at, you know, how the, the silk views that versus how they view um, the HAP, but there's still a higher rate of poverty among HAP households than there is among local authority households, local authority tenanted households. Uh, the, the percentage gap is, is in, in around seven or eight percent. So, you know, it, it, the, the fundamental thing for me was that, well, they, these aren't working. That, that's, that's just, it, it isn't working. We've seen, again, you know, when we talk about gender, we see as I said, low, low, or sorry, lone parents who are predominantly women, um, but also people in domestic duty. So that's how it's framed in Silk is that, you know, the, the poverty rate for people um, who are on domestic duties. And again, what we see there is an increase in the poverty rate. So when we look at that, we see, you know, it, it goes from, 19.4% before any rent or any mortgage interest has been paid to 28.4%. Now, again, like that, that's 85 and a half thousand people, more or less. They're predominantly women who don't have a, an income of their own because there is no provision unless they're on job seekers. There's no provision for people who are, you know, who are in domestic duties or you know, working at home, working in the home to actually have their own money. That leads to an, a whole other conversation around finance, the capacity for financial abuse, the, com, the capacity for you know, abuse within that context. And if there is abuse within the home, how do they how do they escape that if yeah. they don't have an income? And not only do they not have an income, but they've got, you know, they're they're, they're deeper into poverty than most. Um, so it raises like that that whole kind of connection between housing costs and poverty raises huge societal issues not just about you know the the cost of housing which is absolutely outrageous but it's it's also about how we engage with it as a, a policy so Michal Collins had done some work with the St Vincent de Paul back in 2020 around um around the the cost of poverty generally uh, so again, for the piece that we did in in January, I had a look at well, what were the what was the housing element of of that? Um, and again, it the range is between eight hundred and twenty one point three million to one point well, almost one point two billion in terms of the the housing cost of the due to poverty. The conservative estimate estimate there is nine hundred million. So if we actually invested that better. We would have a much better, a much better housing system. We'd have less poverty after housing costs, obviously. Um, but then we need to look at other things. We need to look at the costs of childcare. We need to look at how we engage with tenure types. We need to look at rental. We need to consider things around cost rental, for example. But we need to also look at, you know, the, the regions. We need to look at what's happening in border counties. Um, because they're experiencing significant bumps in housing costs um, or certainly housing cost inflation, housing price inflation. But yet they tend to have very high levels of poverty. So, again, it's one of the it's one of those strange things from the pandemic where we saw an exodus of people leaving uh, Dublin and, and the greater Dublin area and the commuter towns because there was more flexibility in terms of, of work. Now, I know some of that has been contracted back, um, but that has meant that people who are earning Dublin wages are buying Donegal properties, outpricing people in those regions yeah, yeah, yeah. from actually owning their own home. Yeah. Yeah, I wonder as well if even all of this, and it's all, there's some stark numbers there. I was reading the report the other day, and, um, you know, 
I, I wonder if it's all underestimated even still just the way we count things so I, w- one thing I look at a lot is uh, and a pet peeve of mine is just how we kind of uh, count households and uh, we know that the share of adults living at home or and, and it's getting older and older at the average age at which people move out even when it comes to poverty uh, and 60% of the median deprivation as well and then a house cost burden I mean if you're if you're 28 years of age and you're earning 20,000 euro and your parents aren't charging your rent because you, you because you can't afford it maybe you're 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 saying for a deposit there's there's a lot of these you know unofficial homeless hundreds of thousands unofficial homeless out there and their wages get counted towards the household income and divided over the you know the cost of the mortgage which might be zero by now a lot in a lot of cases and therefore they're not their housing board or their affordability issues are not captured in the indicators we use to look at affordability so that i was saying earlier on um there's this and um th- there was a disposable income over house price ratio by kpmg or something or pwc or something the other day dan o'brien was was tweeting it out and it just showed this you know um basically straight line look it's the same as it was in the 80s not that we should be wanting for things to be getting better or anything like that we're, we're, we're completely happy with the uh, housing burden being the same and in, in you know when we think back about the 80s what are the pictures we have with the commitments we've like <laughs> picking, picking bricks for yeah. footballs and stuff like that and apparently it's fine I'm sure we're only complaining and we're only a bunch of complainers when we're when we're talking about housing affordability and of course this this graph is completely Missing the whole point. I mean, wages for for I'm, I I work for a think tank funded by the trade union movement. So obviously, wages. What what? what how far does my wages go? How much do I have to work? How much do I have to study to then work for my for for me to be able to afford decent uh, accommodation? That's the issue. So you've got this this how housing affordability over a time period where you've got the mass. Uh, entry of women into the into the labour market, which means the you know there's more hours per household being worked, like across the board, way more hours on average. And then you've got these issues around disposable income, which counts all the people who are, you know, stuck at home. And you know, it's what is that? You're like, well, sure, what you know, we've we're, we've all studied up. We're all getting more educated all the time. Um, it's not like we should. Uh, we 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 should dream that the 2020s should be better than the 1980s. You know, this is the kind of thing. Yeah, that household thing has bothered me for a long time because it was something in a previous life when I worked in the the debt sector that really struck me as being these policies are made on the basis of how we wish things were. So on the basis that you know. Mammy and Daddy and Jimmy and Johnny all live harmoniously together. And when Jimmy and Johnny go out to work, they pay Mammy and Daddy a certain amount of money. And, you know, it's it's all very egalitarian. And that's just not how life works. And, you know, you'll see Jimmy and Johnny not paying up. Um, or you'll see Jimmy and Johnny trying to save for a mortgage and not being able to pay up. Or you'll see um, Mammy and Johnny's and parents being... not able to afford to keep them or have Exactly. And you'll some... see Mammy and Daddy not able to afford. Or you'll see Daddy earning a significant amount of money, but Mammy getting nothing. Um, you know, and, and, and how relationships work. And it, it, I think a lot of that, you know, we need to start looking at the individuals within the households because that is the real teller. Um, you know, we can't ignore the kind of that the societal issues that impact on these kind of things on, on, on what we can afford. I mean, your income will only be worth to you what it can actually buy it. But you can't say that if you and I are in a household together, your income is my income because, you know, we might be absolutely exactly how policymakers think we should be and split everything 50, 50, or I might get a subsistence to buy the groceries and you might get the rest of it. Um, so it's, yeah, I mean, it's, it's been a real bugbear of mine. And now that we have, I mean, the, the, I think there was a report last year 
from the CSO of 500,000 adults living in the, the parental home, you know, they're earning where they can. Um, and they're obviously going to skew the household earnings. You know, they would be in, in a, a period of normal household formation. They would be in a household of their own or a, a, a number of that 500,000 would be in a household of their own or, you know. So having that as your barometer for for household wealth is is insane because yeah. it's, and, it, it's 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 enforced. It's unwilling. Yeah. So and on the other side, even on the other side of that do, double the the effect there is the the fact that more and more people have their mortgage paid off than they did it mm. 10 12 years ago so you could be having mommy daddy two adult children in their in in their mid 20s maybe on 20 20 20 each and mommy and daddy on 50 each you've got a household with 140,000 with zero with, with zero housing and that's how we count and there's a lot that that is the yeah. case in a lot of areas so obviously on doing wages and we, we we haven't got good time series on wages it, like yeah. and as breakdowns by age and stuff like that so like we the, the one that the CSO have by age are back to 2011 and we can see median um average growth it's something you that there, there are some controls there but there's not i don't think there's a full-time control because it's um administrative data so you don't that's not something you fill in on the survey or anything like that that's not the data available um we have some age gaps and, and just in terms of the, the difference in the price of a, buying a house and renting a house since 2011 compared to the growth in, in wages, it's yeah. just nowhere. The, 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 it just keeps getting worse and worse. So this is like, although I, I mentioned the reason I was looking at that, that IT, those IT figures and the age breakdown. So, so only like 4,000, 30% increase. Um, which is, I think, somewhere in, I think it was around 100,000. So somewhere in the region of 30,000 new IT jobs with like 5,000 went to under 40s, right? So it's not, you know, and, and that's why I, I I look at that stuff. The 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 picture, if you're listening to Pat Kenny or something like that, is like everybody's working Facebook or Google or whatever on, on 150,000 euro and the whole idea of Middle Ireland is all completely off and, and, and completely overestimated and people, if you can see from the way it's it's covered mostly in the media that people don't really have an understanding of what middle, middle income is and what the real wages are. And so, yes, you have this great increase in in the at the high end on, on aggregate, but not for under 40s. And then you got this uh, accommodation field, which is the worst sector in Ireland in, you know, in terms of conditions by almost every metric, you know, more part-time work, more minimum wage work, more temporary work, seasonal, obviously. And um, that's that's where the real growth, and it's way over. And I couple that with retail and the share of employment for across the board, but especially for under 40s. It's just way more of a reality. Those low wage employment is way more of a reality than now. Of course, as you said, the professional, technical, and scientific group did increase, and that's that's a very good thing. Um, but you know, there's there's way more inequality in that labour market than one one would think, or then clearly a lot of people think, or at least a lot of people argue. Yeah, I mean, I was looking. I was actually looking for a, a stat that struck me when you were talking there um, and it comes from the the parliamentary budget office they did a, a snapshot of the housing market that was their first publication of this year actually um and they have i don't know if you can see that but they have this kind of graph here and it's that's the house prices versus earnings it goes from 2011 up to 2020 house prices increased by 77 percent nominal wage growth 23 percent that's what you're up against. There you go. And t- nominal wage growth, 23%. A big chunk of that, I would guess, is in the last three, four years. Most of it, in yeah. fact, I'd say is in the last three or four years. And that's like wiped out like immediately with, with inflation. Um, so um, what we were dis- we were talking about, that. I just had a thought there, and it's after slipped my mind. Um, oh, yeah. So we're talking about, right, the old inflation spiral that everybody fears, right? Now, we're like, the reality is, as I said, as I mentioned before, deprivation rates went up in the year before 
this this crisis. Then in 2020, definitely, like there's no reason I can see that it, it w- w- won't have increased in in 2021 as well. So the minimum wage went up by 30 cent. I think it was three. I think it turns yeah. out about three percent in January. So basically, with a seven percent inflation rate, it means a four percent less. Uh, you know, bang for your book out of out of your wage package, which means that deprivation will, will, will continue to increase. In work deprivation will increase this year, very likely. Now we got the, you know, economists. All types of economists are afraid of I- inflation spirals. But at the bottom end, the minimum wage increase. The, there's reasons to believe there wouldn't it, w- it wouldn't cause a spiral, and that's basically because they they're, they're scraping by as it is. It's not like um, yeah. minimum wage. It's it's not like it's extra money for minimum wage people. It's money yeah. that they needed to pay <laughs> behind on already. That's it exactly. That is it exactly. I mean, I got that question uh, when we did some work around the the cost of living uh, the package that was announced back in February. Um, and it was like, you know, we were talking about kind of core social welfare rates and refundable tax credits. Like if you are earning so low that you don't earn enough to use up all your tax credits, you're on a very low income. Um, and that was the kind of level we were talking about. And the question came in, of, you know, well, well, I mean, if we increase if we increase uh, incomes at that level, sure, that'll cre- create an, uh, an inflation spiral. It's like, no, it won't. These are people who cannot make ends meet right now. This isn't giving money for luxuries. This is giving money to make the basics. You know, the, the CS or not the CSO, the central bank did brilliant work um, when they looked at the, the cost of living and they did it by by quintile. So the, the lowest 20 percent had the highest rate of inflation compared to the, the highest 20%. So those in the, the highest 20% of earners well, this, um, had the this, lowest this, rate this, of inflation. Just, just one thing on that. Like for the last, I, could, I couldn't believe it. Like for the last 10 years, you know, you know, before a year and a half ago or whatever, we pretty much zero inflation. People weren't even talking about real or nominal. for the last, People forgot what that is because it's not mm. interesting in the last 10 years because there was so little inflation. And all the time you're kind of like, how is there no inflation? My rent keeps going up. My 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 housing, the, the, the house prices keep getting further and further away from my from my reach. How is there no inflation? So you're like, okay, so it has to, and it's I mentioned it earlier on, it's this share of older Irish people who are getting to the end of their and and possibly in a lot of cases have zero co- housing cost burden. And in silk, this is this is counted as their housing burden. So they finish off paying the house. So there's no increase. There's, they're dropping off how much they're paying. And then renters are, are are paying that little more. But it's obscured. The two the two experiences are obscured with an average figure. Yeah. So now we we've got this. And even even still, I saw that report and I'm still like, how is it still only that much for that little for, for the bottom <laughs> quintile? If you know, if rent is going up, like the, the you know, Lidl, the difference between Lidl and Dunn's and people more going there is not making up no. for the difference in the rent. The four percent increase, nowhere near it. I I I would imagine unless you've seven children or something like that. I I, I can't see you know, uh, the price of furniture, the price of clothes and stuff like that coming down, making a difference for what you're what we're paying in rent. Yeah. And I mean, that is I mean, there's a couple of things in there. So you've mentioned a couple of times like older people and, and housing and absolutely, you know, 80 percent plus of people over 65 own their own homes and many, many, many without a mortgage. Um, but the the numbers of people who are older, who are past, say, your standard mortgage term, you know, it used to be 65, then during the, the boom, it went up to 70 or whatever, 40 years would get you. Um, but, you know, your standard would be about 65. But the, the number of people age 65 plus that are still paying off a mortgage has gotten higher now. You know, that was between 2011 and 2016 based on the census data. So the next census will be a teller in in that regard, because looking at it and again, you know, from my background, that to me indicates an arrears problem as opposed to a cost of living, a a standard mortgage issue. Um, And then secondly, sure, we know that there is an increase in older people living in rent rented accommodation. 
So if you're on a fixed income and you're living in rented accommodation and you experience a drop off, like that is going to absolutely cripple people into the future. And that's before you start talking about, you know, the, the other kind of cost of living things. Um, but certainly when we talk about cost of living and we talk about incomes, you know, again, and I'm, I feel I, I do need to separate the two because. Older people, again, even if they have their own home and it is mortgage free, they still need to be able to afford to heat it. They still need to be able to afford to feed themselves. They need to be able to afford the increased prescription charges that younger people may not have. Um, and if they... I, I, I do focus on younger people, but I just want to put my hand up and make sure now that I think that we, you know, we obviously should be concerned. About <laughs> I, I, I set it up like that, but I'm not calling for, <laughs> you know, uh, it, it, like the deprivation rates and poverty rates for older people have come down over the last few years where they've gone on for younger people. And that's, you know, the, except for uh, older people living alone. Older people living alone, the, the poverty rate a couple of years ago jumped by 20, or sorry, the numbers in poverty jumped by 20,000. Okay. Um, and again, you know, when we look at the, the central bank's work around the cost of living and the inflation, those age 65 plus had a higher rate of inflation than younger households. Um, but again, a lot of that is concentrated in living alone because, again, you know, they would have now, like, I, I I have to say, you know, that this is something that is concerning, but I know when I say it, I you'll probably get a lot of people going, well, cry me a river. But people who have paid off their mortgage or pay, you know, and, and are living in their home, their home is probably larger than their needs, but there's nothing within their communities that lets them downsize. So they're heating a home that is too big for them. They're they're spending too much on heat because they don't have the capacity to downsize. Um, and again, that, that opens up a whole different conversation around housing and what we need. And again, you know, if there was the possibility of having kind of com you know, community-based housing where you're building for a life cycle, where you're building for empty nesters to be able to downsize, then you've got a, you know, you've got more of what's called kind of your traditional family homes going back into the market. And Again, that kind of supply should drive down prices once it's once you get that critical mass of supply at the right a right price point. What do you think? That's just on that. Like, uh, what do you think the um, arrival of a couple of hundred thousand Ukrainians will do to, to house prices? That's an interesting one, uh, and I've lots of views. I'm not sure many of them I can air. Um, you know, I think in terms of house prices, probably very little in terms of rent. A lot, uh, because we're going to see a scarcity of rentals. I mean, we've already seen over 20,000 pledges of accommodation, whether that's kind of single rooms within family homes or it's it's second properties. Um, you know, so that is obviously then going to, to remove any of those from the possibility of being in the rental market. So I do think that rents will likely increase, uh, certainly in, in the short term. The idea that we would build modular homes for in the short term to then destroy once all the Ukrainians go back to their war torn country uh, is abhorrent. It's such a waste of money. Um, I think if we're going to go building with new technologies, then do it right and make them long term homes. We can move when we want to, Colette. Do we absolutely can move when we want to. And I think, you know, and again, like, I have huge sympathy, huge empathy for people coming into this country from any war torn area from with with any kind of refugee status or anybody who's seeking support and who's seeking help i have got no issue with that i have a big issue in terms of how we are dealing with the ukrainian crisis when you compare it to how we have dealt with any other crisis i think if we have you know 6000 people living in direct provision looking out the window of a mosni center wondering what what's different about maybe, them maybe and i think will, the main thing that is different is highlighting something very nasty about how we do policy here yeah maybe, maybe that'll be the end of direct provision hopefully afterwards because there's a there's a certain hypocrisy there's a there's clear hypocrisy for everyone to see there and i don't think most people i don't think most people irish people uh you know agree with agree with that different differentiation but that's that's a, start, that's a conversation for, for, for another podcast, probably. But I do think it's linked because, you know, looking at it, 
when you when I looked at the the twenty thousand pledges over the weekend, and I was like, there are ten thousand people accessing emergency accommodation, give or take a couple of hundred here and there, um, and have been for the last, you know, we're shy of a decade. Um, and I think the real difference is, and it was someone else, someone far smarter than me that said it, the real difference is the temporary nature of our expectation here. So we are expecting these white middle class Ukrainians to go home after a certain period of time. Whereas if we open up our 20,000 available housing units to our direct provision people who we know are going to be here longer term and who want to be integrated into our communities or to our indigenous homeless people or to our travelers, then that's a more permanent thing. And I just think our we're we need to take a bit of a look at why we're not willing to do that. Um, like somebody gave me the analogy that I thought was really smart, which was, you know, it's like when you invite someone over for dinner and you're willing to share your food and you share your hospitality with them but you're waiting for them to go home at the end of the night. Yeah, and yeah. It's, it, it's that type of a take that we're, we're using now. But for many, they're not going to be able to go home into the short term. Well, many course, might I, and I don't know even medium about medium term. term. Let's see. Yeah. I mean, we, like this is, we, you're, you're being very positive there. Uh, these things, as we know from plenty of other escapades, can, t- can turn into multi-decade fiascos, right? Um, if uh, Anyway... So but was to be really positive, I would take and actually you did it as well, which is which is not of my knowledge of you. Uh, you did the real positive take as well, Kieran, which was maybe this is how we treat, you know, refugees from here on in. And I think that is that is the lesson that should be taken out of this. You know, it's similar to the lessons that we should learn from COVID when we want to move fast enough. The political will is there. The ability to borrow is there. Uh, the capacity to build is there. Um, you know, we can we can put in emergency legislation for all manner of things. We can do that with our refugee, our integration systems. We can do that now. We've shown that we can. That should be our blueprint from here on out, rather than a return, you know, that was just for these people and then a return to to what we had before. But even just on, never mind, like aside from that. I mean, just even what we learned in April of 2020 with the, with the, you know, the state, it likes to pretend it can't move, but it, it can move. Mm-hmm. And it moved very well in Rapidly. 2020. And did, you know, saved a lot of capacity and it was the right decision mm-hmm. to make. Uh, we, you know, so like that Father Jack line, you know, you can, you can move when he wants it or he can, he, he can hear pretty well when he wants it. But... <laughs> <laughs> it's uh and but yeah there's still this game being played about oh we can't take too many i'm thinking particularly on housing and i'm t- mm-hmm. thinking particularly on so we're talking about affordability and, and just just to end on this the the the, the Nevin economic research institute does a lot of stuff on the nature of the irish welfare state and how it compares to other high income eu countries so the best way from from our perspective to tackle inflation uh, if this is going to continue to be uh, an issue, is for the state to intervene in markets that are not working, like in, in housing and like in childcare, to socialise the costs, to bring down the cost for everybody together collectively to make us more productive, make us more competitive, to let women into the... It, it, to, to, to make it easier for women to decide to stay in the labour market when, when they're having kids or, or whatever else like that. So you can tackle those costs of living... Um, by the state intervening, and the state has shown that it can intervene, but the state, uh, and certain, you know, you know, our our discourse in general tends to um, focus on what we can't do, and rad- these things are too radical, and and whatever else like that, and it 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 turns out like there's there's a bunch of things with a stroke of a pen that could be done, um, that that aren't. Yeah, I mean, I think. I entirely agree with you with the proviso that there needs to be some targeted interventions for very low income households. So, you know, absolutely in terms of socializing, the the things that need to be done around housing and and childcare in particular are two huge uh, outlays for households. Um, But, you know, there need like when we saw the package of cost of living um, that came out in February, you know, the idea that the 200 euro voucher can apply to your primary home and your holiday home like that you know that just wasn't thought mm-hmm. out enough 
Yeah, yeah. Um, so, you know, there needs to be more kind of targets for people who are on very low incomes so that they can start to kind of get that level playing field that they, they just don't have capacity to have. Yeah. And there's there's a, just another one as well. We 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 talk about retrofitting. It, it now is you know they were laughing at Trump in the UN a couple of years ago when he was talking about Germany being on the, you know being um, reliant on on on. They all laughed in his face. You know, not that. Let's not make this that I am some Trump fan or something. <laughs> just so, but Here he is pro Trump. <laughs> we are we are dependent on import of fossil fuels, yep. right? Um, we are not going to hit our, our targets. There's there's a case for the state to intervene and just retrofit as as uh, pay the state to pay for its schools, public buildings, social housing stock. There's a return on all this. There's good apprenticeships and these middle income jobs for for lots of people who might not, you know, who might not want to go to college. Everybody's going to college, you know, and mm. that, that would be another area. But for, you know, to tie, this this cause inflation could go crazy. I mean, the, 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 yeah. it's and the state is, you know, the, whatever solution so far. A check here and there. First of all, is not you know not helping the actual individuals it is helping but it's not it's not meeting the, the challenge and then but it's all short term we need to start talking long term that 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 issue of dependency on on um especially with with you know data centers and stuff like that that's not going away it's only going to get worse and it absolutely is only going to get is worse the vehicle through which we can tackle that and i mean even looking at the retrofitting i mean what we did was an improvement on what had gone before. So there are those kind of three stages of retrofitting plans. You know, there's one for that the upfront costs are paid for people on social welfare, but there's plenty of people who are working who can't afford the upfront costs no, um, and that's not going to help them. We've then got, and like that applies to houses that are built pre-2006. And then we have the other two that are, are dependent on upfront costs being paid they're only going to be available to people who can actually afford to have that savings. And for some, that can be like €30,000. There well, are very few households that are going to be able to pay that off like that. And, and most of the households who are going to be able to pay that are probably over 40. And the return, your return yeah. on investment does come back for 20 years yeah. on it. And so who's got, you know, people are, the state has to intervene to make that more viable for people. Because I, I, I was at a round table with, you know, somebody who, uh, it was it was, just, it was just at one of these, um, it was at a conference anyway. And, you know, the, this person's wages are a matter of public record. So I, I knew I knew what this person was earning. And this person said, oh, I, 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 um, I, I, I priced a heat pump there recently and it's, it's too much. And I was like, well, if it's too much for you, because <laughs> this person was, you know, by by definition, in the top two or three percent of the income distribution, and this person had decided that a heat pump was not worth it for him. So, but you can uh, see that the deprivation data, you know, there are more, you know, there, there's an increasing number of people in higher incomes that are experiencing deprivation as well, um, and that is, you know, that that's a, a an overall cost of living thing, I think. But I, I think to your point in relation to the return on the on investment when it comes to retrofitting or anything really climate related. Again, we did a podcast there with CLM, Community Law Mediation and DCU. They had published a report last week on environmental justice. And as one of them said, um, it's the difference between the end of the world or the end of the month. So you can't expect people who can't get to the end of the month to care about what's going to happen with the end of the world because they can't make ends meet. To end, to end on a, you know, on-brand negative note, Colette, uh, that was wide, a wide-ranging conversation and very informative and appreciate your your, your contribution. And um, maybe next year around the same time, we'll, we'll, we'll do a check-in on the labour market again if you'd be interested. I most certainly would. Thank you very much for having me.